Awesome. So we're good to go. So hello, everybody. My name is John, and I'd like to welcome you to the Brand Storytelling Masterclass. Um, we've put together this class as part of our promise to help um, business owners, young entrepreneurs, and leaders, you know, in these times, right, with all of the resources, all of the knowledge that we have um, to help them scale and to help you scale through these times, right? So as much as possible, we're putting in effort to teach everything that we do at FutureSoft for our clients. Um, to help you, um, you know, scale through this this period. If there any value you can offer in your business, if there's anything you can do extra for your clients, as much as possible, we want to help you get, get to that point. And that is part of why we're actually having this class today. So I'm welcoming you officially to the Brand Storytelling Masterclass with John Madifora. So I would move on to my next point. But again, like I had said before, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the message sections. I'll go through it at intervals and I'll answer your questions as they come. And again, um, at the end of the session, we'll also have a Q&A, interactive Q&A, where you can ask questions or give me feedback as well. Um, please let me know at any point if there's break or you can't actually hear me or anything so we can fix that on our end. All right, so I'm going to move on with my slides. So the first thing we're going to talk about is what a story is, right? What is a story? So um, this is, I mean, this is a class that I've, you know, designed to be practical, as practical as possible, right? And all of the things that we're sharing today are things that are relatable. So as much as possible, you'll be able to find yourselves in the story that we're, um, the things we're going to share today. Um, so in the next few minutes, I want to talk about what a story is, right? Um, a story is an account of imaginary or real people and events, right, school for entertainment. Now, these are examples that I picked up Google because as much as possible, I wanted to explain the things that we see every day, the things that we can easily see, you know, and we, how we can apply them. So a story is an imaginary or real, um, an, an account of imaginary or real people, right, or events told for entertainment. The other part is it can be an account of past events in someone's life or the development of something or a project. A story can also be a particular person's representation of facts, you know, of a matter. Now, the thing I love about these three different definitions of what a story is, is that it doesn't mention the fact that a story has to be true or anything, you know, close to that. It doesn't mention the fact that a story has to be anything as what it happens. So what we've seen so far, or we've seen in life is that, um, and we can all attest to this, right? When somebody tells you something, and it's interesting. The next thing is that by the time you're telling somebody else, you have processed it in your brain. You've put scenarios in your head, how it would have happened. And you automatically feel like the person who told you has missed some part of the story, right? And then you then add your own. That's why when stories move up, move around, it changes, right? And we're going to see that play out very soon. So that is what a story is. I mean, if you just Google it, what a story is, that's what a story is. A story can be an account. It can be somebody's record of an experience. It can be me just telling you my life story. So there's no direction as to where a story must come from, right? But there are the things that a story should have that I'm going to explain later, into, later in this masterclass. But there's no direction as to a story doesn't have to be the story of a tortoise or a goat, as most of us are used to, right, in this part of the world. Or the story of the folk tales and tales by moonlight. It doesn't have to be that. A story can be any of these different things. As long as people can find themselves and find a connecting point to what you are sharing, it becomes a story. Um, Guys, I'd like to uh, take three seconds to fix the sound. I don't know if you all can hear me clearly or you can hear any kind of noise. So just give me two seconds. Okay, guys, I'm back. I'm sure the sound is clearer and it's better when you hear me now. So I'm very sure because I could hear the sound myself. Okay, so. I'm sharing this slide because it's something that I love. I came across it sometime earlier this year and it reminds me of a lot of things. So what comes to your mind when you see a tortoise, right? Um, some of us have not seen a tortoise in real life. I have only seen a tortoise once. So if you are one of people who hasn't seen a tortoise in your life, well, this tortoise is big enough and can count for the fact that you have actually seen a tortoise. So yeah, while most of us haven't seen a tortoise, I mean, in real life, we don't have to see, see a tortoise. Um, there are stories that we've heard about tortoise, right? And if I ask us, if I talk about the tortoise, what is the first thing that comes to our mind? I'm sure some of us will give us examples like this. My name is everybody. If I say my name is everybody, you remember the story, right? If I say, oh, I'm cunning. Somebody say, yeah, every time I think about the tortoise, it reminds me of a cunning animal. Oh, I'm smart. Oh, I'm slow. That is what um, 
that is what I mean comes to a lot of our minds, and I'm sure there are more of these different things. Um, I want to confirm that you all can still hear me, so um, I'm getting signals. I want to be sure that you all can still hear me. So please, if for any reason you can't hear me, please um, get my attention. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, so you would hear that, I mean, tortoise is cunning, tortoise is smart, tortoise is slow, tortoise is a deceitful animal, all of these different things. But um, I doubt that anybody here has had a race with a tortoise before to know whether it's slow or not. I doubt if anybody here has been duped by a tortoise, right? But we have all of these different stories. And it's something that we have constantly told ourselves because at some point, stories don't just connect us to reality. Sometimes it helps us escape from reality. We all know that some of the things that we hear in, this, in the stories and folk tales that were taught were almost impossible, right? We hear stories how the tortoise marries the, the king's daughter, right? Or how the tortoise married, and the king is always the lion, right? How did, how did the tortoise marry a lion's daughter? But we don't question things like that, right? And the tortoise fell from the sky and broke his shell, right? But we all know that the tortoise didn't break his shell. But, or how does the tortoise child has a broken shell. How does the child have a broken shell when the father, you know? So all of these different things, we don't ask ourselves. It just comes out very nice when we hear it. We just love it. And that's the amazing thing about storytelling. Storytelling doesn't have to be true, like I have said. As long as people can find themselves in the story that you share, they love it, right? And they will keep sharing it. You know, stories like this are stories that we have been told from when we were kids, and we never get tired of stories like this. So I'm going to move on to my next slide. Right about now. Okay. So now, Yes, so what I've explained before is something you see in my next slide. So a um, story defeats, you know, the numbers. A lot of people would be like, oh, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Let's calculate. But stories don't always go along with the numbers. When I talk about numbers, I mean, stories doesn't always have to make sense in terms of, you know, if I put one and two together, right? But as long as it creates a connection, what story does is create connection. So right now, I'm going to talk about brand storytelling and how it relates to all of the things that we've talked about. So... I was doing research about like some you know brands that have really told amazing stories and i've done this for a while and one of the stories that i really love there are a lot of them but one of the stories that i really love is uh, um is the um story that you know that nike has be behind his brand and you know once nike has always done like really amazing storytelling i mean they are one of the biggest brands today that has scaled to where they are because of the stories that they have told. Um, so Nike once, I mean, this was like in the 1999 or 1998 or so, right? And this was when there wasn't even social media. And I'm going to give us a, a lesson in what I'm going to share. So um, Nike once did an ad that lasted for 53 seconds, about a minute, yeah? And they did that in commemoration of Michael Jordan's, you know, life, as a basketballer, right? They showed when he was in secondary school, you know, when he started playing basketball, all of these different video clips with an emotional song, very beautiful ad, right? But even though they have a commission to do that ad, there was nowhere until the last two or three seconds that mentioned anything about Nike, right? Nike didn't say, oh, it was us, or buy Nike shoes, or Michael Jordan wears Nike shoes, or showing Michael Jordan going to the store to buy Nike shoes, right? They just showed Michael Jordan as a person, his life story. And there's a reason to this, right? Nike has long understood the importance of storytelling. And understanding the importance of storytelling is understanding the first rule of storytelling that is not about you. It is always about your characters. And most times, the character in your story is not you. It is your customer, right? So Nike is a sports brand that has made its name as one of the biggest you know, footwear brands for athletes, right? And they understand their target audience. They understand their customers. Their customers are people who love um, basketball, who love sports. And if they love these things, that means their role models and icons will be, you know, great basketball players and all of these different people. So running an ad and putting Michael Jordan in front of them was a very strategic thing to do, right? So the world most successful brands are those who have actually used storytelling up to today. Brands like Coca-Cola, brands like Pepsi, brands like Airbnb, brands like Amazon have all you know, told stories that I'm going to share at different points in this masterclass. Right, so I'm going to move on to my next slide. Um, a little bit of time travel. Um, so just to explain to us furthermore that storytelling has been something that we have done and it hasn't expired. It's still very much valid, right? So in the past, we've consumed content in different forms. We've consumed content in print. I mean, we still do print today, but it's fading away. Um, 
we do content in, on radio, we do content on television, we do content in the movies, and we go to the cinema, right? And all of this content is still stories, right? So, and now we're at a point where, you know, there are digital platforms where we can consume content, there are podcasts, you know, there's YouTube and all of these different, and the amazing thing that is portable. So what we have seen happen is content has moved from something that we have to go to a place to experience to something that we carry everywhere. Storytelling has evolved, content has evolved, right? But what's really changed, right? It is not the stories that we have told or it's not the content that we have shared that has, you know, that has changed, but the platforms that has changed. So what we have seen change in the last you know, few years or in the last 10, 10 years or 20 years is that, I mean, if you're on Facebook in 2010, you find a lot of people writing long, long text and long, long stuff. But as time went on, there's abundance of information. There's too many information to consume. There are so many people on Facebook. There are so many people on Instagram. There's so many people on the internet creating content. I mean, if I go and search on Google how to make jollof rice, I'll find 20 pages of legit content of how to make jollof rice, right? So there's a struggle for eyeballs. There's a struggle for people to see content, to see stories, to see whatever it is that you're sharing. So what has happened is, we're not adapting to different platforms. I'm tired of reading long text or long form content. So I want to just watch, right? I don't want to read recipe. I want to see you make it. So I would rather watch a YouTube video that's showing me how to make a particular recipe than to read a book on how to make that recipe, right? I'd rather listen to a podcast, you know, or listen to an audio book than to hold a book and read. So, I mean, all of these things are things that humans have evolved, you know, to want. That's why in my previous slide, I had a boss and in my new slide, I have a car. Right, the bus and the car will still take us to a particular destination, they will still move from one place to another. But one is more comfortable than the other, one is more slick than the other, one comes in a finer design than the other, which is what people you know want to see today, right? So, this is what has changed. But content itself and what we consume has not really changed. Now, we are hardwired um, for stories, right? And this you know, is where I'm, I've been coming from that whether we don't really care. I mean, we care whether stories are true or not, but once we find connection, you know, between ourselves and stories that are being told, it makes a lot of sense. And the truth is that there's no one person that is an island. Everybody needs a representation of themselves. And that's where brands come in. Now, a lot of brands have been advised before now that, oh, it doesn't make sense for you to, you know, bring your personality or um, bring emotions into, you know, business, separate it. But the truth is that there's, like I said before, there's abundance of content out there. There's abundance of stories out there that you just have to be unique. And people are gravitating more to the personal side, right? And an example is, I mean, a different example is see how we are all reacting to, you know, isolation and quarantine and all of these things, right? People miss the connections. Human beings are built for connections. And one of the easiest way for us to find connection is true stories, right? Stories connect us, you know, to history, to people, to places, to ourselves. So we are hardwired for stories, and that's why stories are amazing, right? Now, to explain why stories work for us, right? A lot of our decisions are influenced by stories. Let me give you an example, right? You walk into a mall to buy toothbrush, right? I bet that you're not going to see the toothbrush on the same rack where they're selling snack, right? Or you walk into the mall to pick up, um, I don't know, shortbread biscuits. You're not going to find shortbread biscuits um, where they sell soap or where they sell groceries. You're going to find it where they sell other biscuits. Now, I give that example to you know, say this. If you are a manufacturer, you're a content creator, or I mean, you're a business owner, and you find yourself in, I mean, having a product in the mall, why should I skip 20 other brands to come to you? And we find ourselves doing that a lot, right? Subconsciously, most times. We enter the mall, we walk straight a rack of the same products, but we go to a particular brand. Other times we find ourselves defending the brand, you know, and sometimes we can't even say the reason, right, actually, but we just feel that we love this brand so much. There's a connection we feel with the brand, right? And it's because over time, we've taken the things that happened around us, we've put it in our head, we've created a story, right? And we've put it in a story scene, and then we've come out and say, this is how it makes sense to me. I like this thing. It just connects with me. Oh my God, this is this, this is that, right? So one time I was talking about how I don't believe in, um, in zodiac signs, as to why zodiac signs, you know, um, affects the way we think as human beings, right? Or how would you blame the fact that you gossip a lot because your zodiac sign says you gossip a lot. But human beings are built for connection. They are built for stories, right? 
if I start, if I realize that, oh my God, I like to talk a lot and I go on Google and I find that my people that have my zodiac sign talk a lot, I'm like, yeah, that's me, that's me, right? I find a reason. People need a reason to connect with a brand, to connect with anything. So when you tell stories, what you do is that you build value systems that your customer or your audience can find themselves in and they can connect with you. Now, when people find themselves in such connection, it's really, really hard to take them off. Right, people will do anything, they will defend you anyway. They become brand loyalists, they become brand ambassadors, right? So, and that is how we think as human beings. And like I said, most times it is subconscious, like we really don't know why we just think that way, but we just find ourselves defending brands and you know, being like, Yeah, I love this brand, it's the best brand, that's why I always buy them, right? But the truth is that that brand, you don't love the brand because they make the best product. There are probably brands who make better products, there are probably brands who make the same quality products. So, when you live in a society, when your competition makes a product that is as good as yours. How do you stand out? By creating a value system, by telling stories that can connect you with your audience, that can connect you with your target audience or your customers. Okay, so um, I left um, short slides that I call like tea breaks. So tea breaks are just where I would share um, simple words that I love and I think that would stick with you. Um, so i would shared this before. Sometimes reality is too complex and stories give it form. This is a quote by Jean Luc Gokard, right? Um, reality is too complex. And that is why most times we find ourselves enjoying stories of tortoise and the air and very weird things, right? And at the end of the day, we're like, how do we even believe this thing, right? But it was just amazing that every point in our life, we need to escape from the business of reality. We need to escape from all of the hassle, right? And we need to find comfort in stories. And that's what stories does to us, right? So now I'm going to dive into what brand storytelling is. So we've talked about what stories are and all of these different things. So what you need to understand about brand storytelling is not the definition of brand storytelling. What you need to understand is the rule of brand storytelling. So like I said before, there's no definition of how your story should start or where it should come from, what your story should be. Your story could be personal. It could be why you started your business. Your story could be how your business has grown over the years. Your story could be how your business came out of the fall and has built to become a multi-million dollar business. Your business can be how we survive. Your story can be how we survived the coronavirus, you know, pandemic as a business that, you know, that didn't have any resources, right? It could be anything. You don't, there's no definition as to be what a story is, but what it is is a rule to what a story should be as a brand, right? Now, this is the rule that you have to understand, and I'm going to call it whatever rule you want to call it, but don't talk about what you make, right? When you come to brand storytelling, you don't talk about what you make, but you make, you talk about what you make happen, right? That's what brand storytelling is about. So you don't talk about what you make, but you talk about what you make happen and, you know, why you do what you do. That's why, that's why it is important. So I was, you know, also looking at different brands and, you know, that share brand storytelling um, very, very well. And one of the brands that I really love is the, um, is the, the iconic Apple brand, right? I mean, and I'm not saying that because I love Apple brands. I don't use an Apple device currently, but I love Apple brands. And I have seen how people defend the Apple brand, like, oh my God, like if you go Mac, you can't go back. Like iPhone is the best, MacBook is the best, and all of these different things. But what we don't understand a lot is why most people use Apple. Even people who use Apple devices, most people don't know why. But Apple has built their systems around stories, around the things that matter to people a lot, around ease of access, around you want to have access to this easily, right? Trust me, using a Mac is very, very easy, right? So they brought all of these things, which I'm going to explain later, right? When MacBook, when they started the, um, the Apple device, Apple said, you know, at the time when Apple started their company, then it was just, it was just Windows, you know, and all of these different um, devices. And they were only available for, you know, offices and, you know, people, corporate organizations. So Apple actually came into the market to say, you know, we want to make pieces and devices available to households, to people, right? They happen to make amazing devices, but they didn't come out to say, hey guys, so we cannot make computers for your house, come and buy, right? Because that is talking to the person's head and they're gonna just be like, oh my God, this computer is going to be expensive. And trust me, Apple devices are expensive, right? But Apple didn't come out to say, we're gonna sell devices to you. So you don't start thinking about 
you had to start saving money. What Apple said first was, we believe that every home, every student, every household should have access to a computer, right? It should not be restricted to companies, to organizations. So we're going to, you know, produce computers that are designed for the home, that are designed for students, that are designed for personal, you know, use and all of these different things. So Apple came out to talk about, you know, why they're doing what they do. And they made it about you. They didn't make it about what they do. So that's the first rule of brand storytelling. When you're going to tell a story as a brand, you don't start with what you do. You start first with why you do what you do, right? You talk about the things you're trying to solve, the problems you're trying to solve. So I'm going to move on to my next slide. Um, now, why should you tell more stories as a brand? Um, and it's really simple, right? Storytelling gives you the opportunity to invite your customers into your world without taking them out of their world. And it's, that's the clear difference between storytelling and you know, sell, 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 right? So I'll go back to the Nike ad, right? So Nike has shot an ad to commemorate Michael Jordan's life as a basketballer. He showed the ad, right? They know that Michael Jordan's fans are probably going to be Nike fans, right? Because they all love basketball, right? And if they're not Nike fans, they're going to be Nike fans when they learn that Michael Jordan wears Nike, right? But for 53 seconds, they showed an ad on television. And at the time, I mean, it was TV. TV ads were expensive. It's not now where you have YouTube and you can use $2 to promote a video. It was TV, right? So when they understood this long ago, you know, that storytelling is really powerful. And why it might not give you money immediately? It's a long-term game. And that's why a lot of people have come to love brands today. So, you know, they shot this ad. But what they realized that it wasn't about them. It was about the people. How can we bring these people into our story? Nike believes the same thing that their audience believe. They believe the same thing that their customers believe. And so what they did was to shoot an ad that brought people into their world, into the world of Nike, right? When you're in the world of Nike, but you didn't really have to live where you are. You love Michael Jordan. You saw the ad for 53 seconds. They kept you hooked on the ad until at the end of the ad, they said, just do it. And they put the switch sign Nike, right? And trust me, why they have not said, come and buy, come and buy, that ad alone has gone you know, far to sell shoes for Nike, to sell the brand and create top of mind awareness over the years for that particular brand. Because people have come to see that you're not a brand that is selfish, you're a brand that actually put them first, right? And I want to explain that again as we go into the um, class. Okay, so now how do you start? So um, we have, I mean, when we were planning this masterclass, it was about giving you practical steps, right? So where you understand everything that brand storytelling is, is to also understand how we start telling brand stories that actually resonates with people. So I'm going to give you three steps, you know, to creating brand um, stories that actually move, that actually move people, that actually connect with people. And the first one is look within, right? Um, you may be asking, okay, how do I start, right? So the first thing is look inside of yourself. As much as, you know, brand storytelling has nothing to do with, or should not have everything to do with you, but you know, should have your customer at the forefront, right? But it is strategic and you have to make sure it comes from you first of all. So great brands don't start to tell you what they do, right? They look within and then they tell you why they do what they do. So they start with why. So great brands tell you why they do what they do instead of what they do what they do, right? But they start with why they do the things that they do. So as a business, the first thing you want to go back you know, to your drawing board, the first thing is you want to go back to your drawing board and you want to go and check why do I actually have this business? What problem am I solving, right? And that is where your story should start, you know, coming from within you. And that's what Apple has done. Apple went back and said, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Why are we actually doing these things, right? And then when you come out understanding why you do what you do, you can start from selling your story to say, okay, hi, my name is John. You know, I sell this because I'm trying to solve this problem, this problem or the other problem, right? And at the end of everything, this is what I happen to make, right? But you don't start from saying, oh, I'm trying to sell shoes to you, the shoes are nice, all of these things, no, right? Or you could say something like, oh, we started this brand because we believe that every kid is, you know, every child should have a shoe, right? Or I started this company because I went to a village somewhere and I discovered that people do not have shoes because they didn't have money. So I decided to start a shoe company that was, you know, that totally operated on locally sourced raw materials to, first of all, you know, create shoes and we're supporting people who make raw materials in Nigeria. It's cheap so we can sell to people in, you know, places who don't have money to afford luxury shoes, right? So think about that story as opposed to think, saying, 
oh hi guys we happen to make great shoes you know come and buy shoes and all of those things is made with this and this and that no you start from why you're doing what you do if people find a reason to connect with you they are going to stay rather if your product is not even good what you would see is people coming to say hey hi i love your brand so much and i really love what you're doing you know but i think that you know you, you guys should have this or you guys should have that so you'd have customers who would come to you to suggest products or to suggest improvements on your services rather than customers you know say oh my god i don't like this thing it's messy right because they already have connection with you and they'd rather see you you know prosper as a business as opposed to saying oh i'm trying to sell something to you and they're coming to buy because you have not met them from their head you have not met them trying to sell something to them you met them from their hearts and from the beginning they have found something that connected them to you as well so that's why it's very very important as a business to start from inside of you first what is the problem you're trying to solve bring that before you then go to sell a product so the next thing we're going to talk about is what do you do better than anybody else right so you've talked about why you do what you do so the other thing is what do you do better than everybody else this is the other why you do what you do so if you're wondering okay why do I do what I do? How do I start my story? Go back to your business, right? Evaluate your business. You can find something that you do better than everybody else. So I'm going to give you an example, right? Um, a, I'm going to use a shoe brand again, or I'm going to use a clothing, um, a fashion brand this time, right? So there's a fashion brand that is out there that sells um, really affordable luxury fashion. So it's not cheap, but it's affordable because it's luxury. Right? So for its kind of, for its kind of a product, it's affordable, right? And the brand starts out to say, oh, for every single time that, I mean, you buy a product from us, you donate $1 and it goes to charity or, I mean, we give X amount of dollars for pe to people who don't have clothes, right? That is something that makes them stand out, right? As a brand, that is something you do better than anybody else. So when I talk about the things you do better than anybody else, it's not about your products. So people make the mistake of, going back to say oh let me see my product and let me see whether i'll add an ingredient it's amazing yes add an ingredient your computer will just re replicate and just do it again right and but what you want to do is something that you know touches the heart something that connects people on a different level on an emotional level and that's something that brands cannot copy right because by the time i'm emotional with you anybody else that comes is just somebody that's trying to woo me right it's just an example it is i mean Somebody's trying to move me and I'm like, oh, no, sorry, I'm in a relationship. Oh, sorry, I'm married, right? That's what it is because you're already in a relationship with that brand, right? So it's hard to come out of that relationship as opposed to the fact that the only thing you have to offer is a great product. If somebody else does a great product and drops the price by $1, you've lost the customer, right? But when you have a great product and you have an amazing story, people would spend money. And give themselves and give themselves an example, right? Why they are spending an, an excuse as to why they are you know, spending that money, right? So somebody will tell you that, oh, this is the reason why I'm buying this phone. You know, it's really good. You know, because it does this, it does that. Have you checked the settings on the phone? Or this shoe is very light. You know, when I wear it, I just go out. I don't feel like I'm wearing anything. Blah blah blah. Meanwhile, you've actually produced the light tone of that shoe. It's probably cheap. You know, cheap. I mean, a more cost-effective material as opposed to the person who makes heavy sole shoes. But because they've already connected with you on a different level, they are giving themselves an excuse as to why they're spending so much money to buy your product. So when you connect people on that level, it's easy to now you know, sell an actual product to them. So this is your why, right? And as a brand, you have to own your why. Why are you in business, right? So another brand can come up and tell you that, oh, I have an accounting business, right? So, you, so you're an accountant, so you help small businesses do their tax, so you help small businesses keep their bookkeeping and do all of the things that they need to do as businesses and say, oh, you know, want to focus on your brand. There are several ways you can sell that. But what if you come out and say that, oh, you realize that a lot of businesses, right, a lot of small businesses don't even understand, you know, what bookkeeping is, how to manage their money. So there's always issues. They have issues with tax, you know, and at the very early stage, at the early stage of their, their business, they already have issues with tax agencies or tax and government tax office and all the rest of them because they didn't have, they didn't get the advice they're supposed to get when they started, right? So that becomes your story that you're asked there to help small businesses, you know, succeed, especially the African businesses who don't have access to information like this. It's different from coming out to say, I'm trying to send, you know, my service to you. I'm the best tax person in, in Nigeria. I'm the best tax person in this part of the world, right? When you're coming to say, this is what I'm trying to solve, right? That is your story. That is what you do better than everybody else. Tell stories. This is not your product again, like I've said. 
this is something that you do better and it all comes from within you. Now, the other thing you want to also answer is, how do you do this, right? So now that you have the attention of your audience with an amazing story, right? You don't want to talk about how you achieved this. So I come and meet you and I say, I have a dream that, you know, Nigeria one day or Africa, right, will be a continent where there's equal opportunities for women, you know, women have equal opportunities to do the things they want to do, to impact their community, to do all of these different things. That is a story, right, on its own. You have not mentioned what you're doing currently, right? How do you solve this? I'm solving this by creating, you know, or I have a brand that is set up and empowers women. So I'm, a, I'm going to set up a business that empowers maybe 70% of my staff are women on there, right? So I'm like, oh, interesting, right? So you have a business that's employing probably 600 people. And, you know, 70% of 600 people are women because you believe that women have this genius in them. They can actually create something. And with your, with your brand or your business succeeding, you can inspire other businesses to actually give opportunities to women to show their star and to show their talent, to show their genius, right? I've still not said what I'm selling, but I'm giving you an example as to what I believe in and how I want to achieve it, right? So this is where you now get to the last part to talk about what you sell in your story, right? So you cannot be, oh, we happen to make great cashew nuts, right? So we'll go over that again, right? So the first thing I said was, hey guys, um, you know, I believe, or my company believe at so and so company that, you know, um, um, women or African women are smart, they are they hardworking, they are all of these different things. You just need opportunity, you know, and a society that's enabling so that they can actually contribute and impact the community. This is something I believe in. I do it in my company that employs over 400 women, you know, out of maybe 500 people, right? Amazing, right? And the next thing is, oh, we happen to make great cashew nuts, right? So I have come from why I do the things that I do to what I'm doing currently and then what I actually sell, right? I'm talking about cashew nuts. I'm going to talk about a brand, a Nigerian brand that actually has a great um, story behind them. So this brand is called Food Pro. Food Pro is a client we have at FutureSoft. Uh, Food Pro um, sells cashew nuts, processed cashew nuts, premium cashew nuts, probably you know, one of the best, not one of the best, probably the best premium cashew nuts in this part of the world, not just Nigeria, right? And you know, Food Pro has an amazing story that we've worked with Food Pro for a while to create an amazing you know, journey for them since you know, they started you know, their digital journey as a brand that's trying to scale. And Food Pro, every time you buy Food Pro, you find an amazing story behind all of their cashew nuts, all of their websites, right? And every time you even come in contact with a brand, you'd find this story resonating in the content that they share, you know, on every single piece of content that they share with you. And it's the simple story, right? If you buy a piece of a cashew nut and you go to the back, you find a story that says, um, from the CEO, right? Um, that says our story. So one day, and I'm going to just narrate the story. So one day the CEO was working in the factory and Lola, who is a particular lady, uh, walks up to him, said a word of prayer to him. And he asked, oh, why, why are you praying for me, Lola? And Lola said, um, I pray for you for all of the things that you do here at um, Food Pro. I mean, I'm excited about you know, the company and all of these different things, said nice things to him, and then went on to say that you know, she prays that the factory is open because the factory is how she's able to work, earn a living, and take care of her family, right? So it was such an, an amazing story of you know, how the people who work, one of the women who work there actually you know, is a, um, appreciates the fact that she has a job and she can take care of her family and impact her society. But that was not the end, right? So further into the story, you then see something that says that every time you buy a pack of this cashew nut, food pro cashew nut, right? You don't just buy a cashew nut, right? You support Made in Nigeria, which is the first thing, right? Supporting Made in Nigeria. Um, you help to keep our factory open and you help women, over 400 women like Lola, to, you know, have a job and sustainable income and take care of their families, right? So you can see an amazing story that did not start from the fact that we sell cashew nuts. It started from the fact that they were trying to create impact. They were trying to change the world. They believe that the world can be a better place with more women empowered and equipped to, you know, do the things that they can do, right? The amazing things that they can do. And then they went on to say, this is how we're trying to solve the problem. And this is what we sell, right? So every time you buy that pack of cashew nuts, you don't just feel like someone that's eating cashew nuts. You feel like you're a part of something that is bigger than you. And which is something that storytelling does. Storytelling connects you to a brand and makes you feel like you're not just buying the product. Like, oh my God, every time I buy this shoe, I'm donating shoe to one guy in one village that is walking barefoot in the law. Every time I buy this shirt, I'm contributing $5 to one child and to pay for their school fees, right? So when you tell stories like that, that starts from why you're doing what you do as opposed to 
start as opposed to starting with what you do, right? You connect people emotionally. By the time you now come and tell me that that pack of cashew nuts is, you know, 2000 I'm not going to be like, oh my God, it's expensive, right? I don't be like, oh my God, yeah, this is how you're able to pay the women in the factory. This is how, much, this is how you're, you know? And I give yourself, I give myself excuses as to why the cashew nuts is this price, right? So I find myself telling people that, oh, there's a reason why this person is selling this thing for this price, you know? It's hard to do business in part of the world. You know how regulations are. You know how this is. This. How would they be able to keep the factory open? How would they do this? How would they do that? Right? You find your customers saying things like this because they are already emotionally connected to you, right? And that is what you want to achieve right, with your brand. Customers who don't have to think with their head, right, but already emotionally connected to you, and can now become your brand ambassadors even without you asking them, right? And that's what storytelling does. All right, so another tea break, right? Um, great brands first talk to the heart before they talk to the head, right? And I said that again to say this because we are in a time where there's an abundance of information. People have so many information flying around. People have so many information as to, oh, five ways to do this, five ways to do that. I'm going to tell you how to lose weight. I'm going to tell you how to gain weight. I'm going to tell you how to do all of these different things, right? Um, you just have to pay this amount of money. You just have to do this. So there's almost no information you want to share now that doesn't have a copy somewhere on the internet or, or somebody that hasn't even tried to replicate what it is you're trying to do. So the easiest way to get to people is to get to their hearts first, offer them benefits. In fact, I'm going to be open to you, right? People want to feel like they are ripping you off, right? It feels good, you know? That's why discounts sell. That's why stories sell. People want to feel like, oh my God, they're getting something from you first before you're getting something from them. And one of the ways to be that person that people feel that, you know, they're connected to a different level is to be open to people, is to talk to their hearts. And by talking to their hearts, it means giving them a benefit first before even asking them to give you something in return. All right, so now the next thing after we talk about looking inside and finding your story is focusing on your audience. So we've talked about the first thing, right? Looking inside of you, finding your story, right? The other thing we're doing now is talking about focusing on your audience. Now, why is it important to focus on your audience? It's, you know, you hear people a lot say, you know, understand your audience, anything you want to do, you have to understand your audience. It cannot be overemphasized how important your audience is to your business and understanding your audience. You cannot be everybody, you know, to everybody. You cannot be everything to everybody. You cannot be a tool that everybody can use, right? You have to understand who your audience is because you are there to solve a particular problem and not everybody has your problem, right? So, and this, why is this very important? This ultimately defines the kind of stories you tell, right? So, when you understand your audience, so for example, the food pro story may not fly in a community that doesn't understand anything about inequalities. Because the women are like, I've been, I've been a woman all my life and I've had opportunities like all my life. So, I really don't understand, right? Right? Why I should, you know, feel special about this brand. So, you have to understand the community that you live in, right? It defines the kind of stories that you tell, right? Okay, with this story resonates with this particular set of people because, you know, they grew up in this particular place and they have this kind of culture, right? It affects the tone with which you communicate to your audience. So you don't go and say, hey, hi, guys, hey, hi, guys. And you know that, oh, my God, people I'm talking to, they don't like hey, hi, and hello, right? They like things like, hi, hello, madam, or hello, sir, or good afternoon, or good morning, right? So once you understand the way people like to consume content, the way people like to be interacted with, you then know how to craft your story. So it's very, very important to even understand your audience from the very beginning. If not, you'd have wasted the time to say a story that people don't like, right? So I was seeing a movie with my brothers the other day. I'm like, why is it that all of these white people, white people movie are always very, very, like, very, very funny, right? Somebody just go and pick a dog on the street and be like, oh my God, this stray dog walk into my house. So all of a sudden, I'm taking care of the dog. Right? Or you're watching a movie that's just very, very weird. I'm like, I can't relate, right? And then I realized that because I don't live in their world, that is the reason why I cannot relate. And that's the same way they would feel when they watch our Yoruba movies and they're seeing witches and wizards fight everywhere, right? I'm like, I don't understand. <laughs> or they see a goat turn into something, right? So understanding your audience and where they come from, the community they live, the kind of things they've been exposed to, ultimately shapes the kind of stories that you would tell. Right, and then the other thing is what platforms do you also use to reach your audience? So, once you understand your audience, you then know the platforms that they are, you know, they spend most of their time on, and what kind of contents they also consume. So, there are people, there are set of people who just consume. I mean, people in my kid brother's generation, right? I still try to read books, 
I still try to read actual text stuff. But every time I find an audio or video alternative, I'm going for it. Like I just dump the book. I'd rather sit in traffic and be listening to an audio book. It just sinks in my head. Or be at home and lie down and listen to an audio book than to sit down and be reading the same thing, right? Because apart from the fact that it's really easy to just listen to stuff, it helps me open my mind and I don't have to be distracted by a lot of things. So yeah, understanding who your audience is and the kind of platforms and the kind of format you like to you know, get content ultimately shapes how you deliver your content to them. So focusing on your, on your audience is very, very important. Another reason, again, like I've explained, is that you cannot be everything to everybody. You are either Windows or Mac. So if you use a Windows, please, I'm not spiting you. We're in the same shoes. I use a Windows as well, right? So I have just said that because Windows will never try to be Mac, and Mac will never try to be Windows, right? They both are serving different purposes for different people. And I have seen different users come out to say, this is the reason why I love this brand. I love it so much. And they defend that brand with all that they have. So it's very, very important that you understand that you have to be somewhere, you have to focus on people who care about your brand. And sometimes when you try to serve everybody, what you end up doing is talking to people who don't care about your story, right? So after you realize what your story is, the next thing you have to realize is who cares about my story? What should I create for them? So I'm going to give an example of Food Pro again, right? So once we understood who Food Pros, I mean, so we realized that first of all, cashew nuts are expensive, right? Not everybody just gets up and buy cashew nuts, right? A pack of their regular cashew nuts about 700 to 1,000 naira, right? I mean, if I use 700 to 1,000 naira to buy granuts, I'll probably buy like three bottles of granuts, right? So, I mean, and I mean, this part of the world, people will be like, oh, no, no, I'd rather go for granuts, right? So, for the people who like to eat cashew nuts and actually spend money on eating cashew nuts, know that it's an expensive, I mean, nut, but they also know the benefits. So they would rather spend money to buy healthy cashew nuts. So all of this is went into our content, right? When we were, when we were selling it, right? We understood that they, 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 they understand the fact that cashew nuts was healthy. So they didn't really care, they were gonna buy it. So we now have an information about our audience. Our audience are people who are concerned about their health, right? So our content also circulates or revolves around the fact that we are concerned about your health, we're concerned about you know, your well-being. So our content revolves around that area. So if you go to food post page, you'll find a lot of you know, posts talking about women, you know, especially during um, seasons of the year where we celebrate women. We take extra steps to celebrate women on, the, on, on, on food pro. And you hear them talking about fitness, about weight loss, about staying healthy, and all of these different things. Because we understood the life that our audience has outside of our products. That is something you have to do. So you can only know that when you understand your product. So for example, if you sell luxury jewelry to, you know, I mean, women, female jewelry, so you have to then think about the woman who buys your wristwatch for $100,000. How much money does she have in her account, right? Where does she work? What kind of lifestyle do people in that class, you know, fall into? What do they do with their every day? Do they like to go jogging? Do they like to do this? Do they like to do that? Your story, your content, all of these different things now revolve around them. So after buying your product, this is one day and you're giving them, for example, right? You're giving them tips on, you know, how to work out, what to work out from home or how to lose weight with some home remedies because we are concerned about their health, right? So we're not just selling cashew nuts. We're telling you, oh, here are five workouts you can do at home, you know, especially now that there's quarantine and you can't go to the gym, you know, because of the lockdown. So, you know, people are like, oh my God, yeah, I find value in this thing because we know that people who buy a cash note are also people who are health conscious. You know, we, we attend to elderly people. We attend to kids as well. So you have to understand the life of your audience, the things that they do. You have to, in fact, in the world, be like in your, your client's life in one day. Understand what they do and create stories and content for them as you go on. Now, the other thing you have to then do is to own your story. This... I cannot overemphasize. Once you have mastered what your story is, like you have a story strategy and you understand who your audience is, if you don't own your story, you're telling a lie. Every single thing you have said is a lie. One of the things that makes an amazing brand story stand out is not the fact that it is true or not. It is the fact that when you tell the story, your entire emotion, every single thing shows that you believe in this thing that you're talking about, right? So owning your story and understanding what you stand for is very, very important. So once you have come to realization of these are my values, these are the things, you know, 
I believe in as a brand. The next thing you want to do is to constantly build content around those values. Part of it is what I've also explained you know, previously, right? So for example, for Food Pro again, right? Consistently they have shared content around the things that revolves, you know, the, the actual story around things that they really like. So yeah, so understanding, you know, what you stand for and constantly building content, you know, around that is very, very important, right? And it's not very, very hard. So when I talk about owning your story and giving value, you know, people are like, oh my God, why am I doing such shooting videos? And, you know, start doing all of these different things. Yeah, you can do all of these things, but it's as simple as educating your audience. It's as simple as entertaining your audience, right? It doesn't have to be very hard. It's as simple as all of these different things, right? So, um, so for example, again, I am a fashion, I'm an entrepreneur and I make you know, high class fashion and all of these different things, right? one value I can give to my audience is to have an IGTV video that is 10 minutes long and show people how they can wear all of the clothes they have 70 times or something. So, I mean, there are people who feel like, oh my God, I've worn this clothes three times and because of the job that I do, you know, oh my God, people are just going to feel like, <laughs> I know you with this clothes, right? So you don't always have to come out to sell stuff, but one value you can give, I mean, you've seen videos of people saying things like, I'm going to show you five ways you can rock this denim shirt, right? And you watch the video, and the person is wearing one shirt five different times and they look totally different, right? As a brand, when you tell me something like that, when you share content like that, it's part of what you share with me, remember you're putting me first. That is your best food, you're putting me first, right? When I want to go out to buy anything, you know, spend money, actually say, let me spend money on clothes, I wouldn't think about the brand that has been selfless, that I have ripped off, that have given me free stuff all of this time, you know, without asking me anything, right? So that's what you want to do. You want to educate your audience. You want to entertain them. Simple things like, you know, educational and entertaining content are things that can actually drive awareness, you know, and also push your story forward and show that, yes, you actually understand the things that you're doing as a brand. Okay, so the big question now is how do you convert, right? So you might just be like, okay, John, we've talked about this story thing. It's really amazing. I have learned a lot, but how do I convert my stories and all of these amazing things that I have said? into actual profits, into bottom lines. Something I've said before is that storytelling may not I mean, convert into money immediately, right? But it's a long-term game. But then when you do it right, storytelling is very, very profitable. And it's one of the pillars that has, hold, that, that has been holding many of the world's most successful brands till today, right? So here are some three tips that I've shared again for how do you convert. So the first thing, know your audience and find their hearts, right? What are the things that your audience are concerned about? So as a brand, we now understand. So let me give you an example, right? If you are an event planner, right? So an event planner, an event entrepreneur, right? You are thinking, okay, what are the issues that people face a lot when they have weddings, when they have birthdays and all of these different things, right? I mean, things are coming late. They have to still oversee a lot of things by themselves. Little hurdles like that are pain points of customers, right? If you're a retail company, things like... Um, food being delivered when it's already cold, right, is a problem. So I was on one of these very big pizza brands. I'm not going to mention their name, but, you know, and people are like, oh, my God, your, your pizzas are always nice and everything. You say very nice things, but, you know, you guys just spend so much time on delivery. Like, you know, I order stuff and the pizza gets me cold. Sometimes I have to, like, send the person back that I can eat it and all of these different things. As a competition, if I see that, I know it's a pain point, right? My message is not going to be that I make great pizza. Everybody makes great pizza. My message is going to be that when you order pizza, you get it in five minutes, regardless of where you are in this vicinity, right? So the first thing I will do as a brand, as your competition, is to find the hearts of your customers, which I already know, and then I will amplify it with the stories I tell. So my stories will be circulated around the fact that we know you guys love great pizza, but then you have to wait so long and it's cold and you don't like it again, right? And everybody will be like, yeah, that's me, right? Once your audience is able to find yourself with your story, amplify their pain. When I say amplify their pain, it means putting salt in the wound, right? Think like, oh my God, yes, you know? And once they're hurt, put the solutions in the content that you're, put, that you're selling. Put the solutions in the product you're selling. Put the solutions in the service. That should not be your messaging. That should be your story. That we have realized there's a problem in the industry, in this area, and we are out to solve it, right? And that is how you convert. Right. First of all, understand what your audience are feeling that they are paying, amplify that pain with the stories that you are telling, and then put the actual solution. Don't just come out and say stories. Put the actual solutions and say this is how we are solving the problems. Right. 
Now, when you get to this point, don't be shy to ask for the other. Right. What a lot of creative people do, a lot of businesses do is that, I mean, you're like, okay, I've told amazing stories, but you know, how, when do I start to sell, right? Once you've carried your customer from that point A to this point where we are now, don't be shy to ask for the order, right? If they're connected to you, they will place the order, but you have to ask. So you have to have a call to action. And this is what food pro does. We know that you have bought a pack of cashew nuts, but wanted to buy more. We know that you have visited the website. We want you to order. We know that you have been watching our video, we want you to order. So at the end of that beautiful story of how, you know, Food Pro employs, you know, a lot of women, over 70, 80% of the people who work in their factories and their offices are women, right? We want to, to, to take an action. So what Food Pro tells you to do is, hey guys, we know you love this amazing story, but you know, we need our factory to be open so we can continue to do these amazing things we are doing. So every single time you buy our cash note and you patronize us, you help to keep our factory open, right? People now see something. People now have a reason to buy your products. People now have a reason to be where you are, right? So a call to action is very, very, very important as a business owner. Don't forget, don't go on telling amazing stories and then forget to put a call to action as soon as possible. Be very, very clear. Let them know what you want to do. So if it's a course, say, buy my course. If it's a cash note you're selling, say, I sell cash notes. If it's the fact that, oh, I do this, I do that. Tell them this is what I do. Pay for it, right? Once people are connected to you, they will not feel the need to withdraw because remember, you have connected to them to your heart already, right? So even if you feel like, oh my God, I don't really have the money, but I need to do this thing. This is the reason why I'm doing it. So it's very important that you understand the rule of storytelling, but it's also very important that you understand where to ask for the other as a brand, as a business owner. All right. So I'm going to share a magic formula as to what every story should have. And this is by my friend, Salem King. Um, he's an amazing content creator. He tells amazing stories. So and in the conversation once, he had shared this, and I thought it was really, really useful, and I was going to share it. So, I mean, there are a lot of formulas that will guide you, but this is one I really love. Your stories must be relatable, right? So these are four things that you must always think about. Your stories must be relatable. Whatever it is you are creating as a content creator, as a business owner, whatever it is that you do, your stories must have a place that your audience see themselves inside of, right? That's why I've explained and taken a lot of time to talk about why you have to understand your audience. Your audience have to hear you talk and be like, yes, that's me. Oh my God, this is hitting home. Or you just mentioned my name without calling my name. Why? Because they can see themselves or they can see their situation in the stories that you share. The other thing is if you're going to sell a service or if you're going to sell something like a how-to or how to do anything, it has to be easily applicable. So for example, in times where you're trying to give some kind of value as a bait to attract people, your value should be easily applicable. Don't be the person who says, hey guys, I'm going to show you how to do this and do this and do that, right? And I finished watching 16 minutes of a YouTube video and I'm like, I just had a lot of things, amazing, nice things, but I really can't apply any of them, right? You want to be the business owner that people will be like, yeah, I watched that 10 minutes video and I was able to do this and this and that. Oh my God, I can't wait for, you know, the other things. And then they're like, how much is, how much is your course, right? Or how much is your product? Because they have been able to apply the little things that you have shared in your story. So your stories, you know, if people are going to be able to do something with it, should be easily applicable. It shouldn't be rocket science. The other thing is it should be memorable. You don't want people to easily forget you. So when you create ads, when you write copies, whatever it is that you're telling as a storyteller, it should be easily memorable, right? And I can tell you of a ton of memorable ads that I have seen and I cannot easily forget, right? But one of my favorite ones was, um, so Mercedes-Benz and BMW always have this battle, you know, in their ads, right? So um, Coca-Cola has the same with Pepsi and all of these different brands. So I'm going to share an, um, an ad that I had seen once and, um, and I hope that you guys find it as memorable as I did, right? So... Um, once I had seen an ad that lasted for 50 something seconds or 59 seconds, right? And it showed, and I think this was a real life event, right? Somebody who was um, maybe a chief designer or something at um, Mercedes Benz was retiring from the company. And, you know, he shot like a documentary to show, you know, his last day in the office. So it was a very nice video, emotional song, and all of these different things, right? And he shows, and he says, oh, last day in the office. And he was packing his desk and everybody was like, they, they, they had a send off party for him. And they were celebrating, you know, this man who has worked here for probably 30 years, use amazing designs and have amazing stuff, you know. And everybody was so excited, you know, and they were like, we're going to miss you. People were excited, people were emotional. 
and you were like, oh my God. I mean, I was watching the ad, I was like, oh my God, this guy has been created in past. And I was just following the was just there, right? The guy left the office and got into his official car, his official driver, you know, taking him home. And he, at the road, he kept looking back and seeing the signage of his office that was leaving, right? The showman was on the road and he saw a billboard of his company, which he has just resigned from, right? Until he got home, he's Mercedes Benz car, right? And all of, you know, 50, 50, three or 55 seconds of this video, right? They kept flashing all shades of Mercedes Benz, their logo, everything, right? And this guy got home, um, said bye and everything to his official driver who took the car back, only for him to open his garage, right? And drove a Mercedes um, and drove a BMW car. And on the screen, we have free at last, right? So it was an ad that took 53 seconds or 55 seconds to market a different brand only to use that last two seconds, right? To market the actual brand, which was a BMW. Guess what, right? No matter how many seconds I've watched this video, I don't care. The last two seconds of watching BMW was loud. It was louder than anything they had seen in the other part of the, you know, of the ad. So, you know, being creative and creating memorable stories, whether I mean you're dissing another brand or you're actually trying to, you know, be emotional or empathetic about a situation, you have to create something that's really memorable, right? So another example is a, um, a laundry, oh, I gave it up already, right? But a laundry business, right, that came out to do an ad, right? Instead of saying, we can wash your clothes for you, they said, don't kill your wife, right? And the ad flips and it flashes and the other thing says, we're going to wash your clothes for you, right? So it's amazing how, you know, brands can, you know, come up with simple creative stories that, you know, are memorable, I cannot easily forget. Another example can be a brand that says, we sell husband material, right? Or I have a website that says husbandmaterial.com, right? And you click on it to go and look for husband and you open it just to find that they sell tuxedos and amazing things for, you know, the groom. So once again, creating memorable you know, stories is very, very important. The last part of this is create your story must be portable, your content must be portable. So create portable content. Every time you share content, you share stories your, with your audience, you have to ask yourself, can this story be shorter? You know, can it, I mean, if you have to be long, yes, as much as possible, put all the details. But if it can be shorter as much as possible, make sure that your story is short and people can get it in the shortest time as possible and consume it in the shortest time as possible. Because again, the attention span of people is very, very short, right? Very, very short. And what I keep telling people is that we have evolved, right? A few years ago or a few months ago, your audience, I mean, your, your audience was sharing your attention with you know, your competition, right? But now your competition is no longer the person who's making the same product that I'm making. Your competition is my cousin, my brother, my auntie, I don't know, anybody in my family that takes very nice pictures, right? The moment I'm spending too much time trying to understand what you are saying, and my cousin puts up a very nice picture on Instagram and says to me, hey, cousin, please go and like my picture. Or I just get WhatsApp notification. Amazing. And I run. I don't even remember why I'm even there. I, I don't remember to come back to your page. I don't even remember why I'm on Instagram in the first place. And I'm like, oh my God, right? And it's gone. So as much as possible, you want to create content that people can binge on in the shortest time as possible. So with that said, we have come to the end of um, to this class. Right? But before we go, I would like to um, share something amazing with you guys. So I've talked a lot about, um, you know, storytelling and content, and I would like to give, you know, um, two amazing materials for free to everybody who has participated in this webinar. So in the comment section, I'm going to give two links to a case study on FoodPro. So I've talked about FoodPro a lot. So FoodPro is a brand that we have worked with, you know, and currently are still working with um, at FutureSoft, and we built an amazing story for them an amazing brand equity for them as well. So we have done a case study, right, explaining some of our favorite brand stories and our journey, practical journey, you know, on building brand equity for FoodPro. So I'll leave that material for you. It has everything about what we did for FoodPro. And I'm also going to leave another material for you to get for free on content marketing. So if you're, if you're looking for inspiration on how to start writing amazing copies that you know resonate with people, we're also going to leave that for you. So with that said, if you have any questions, I'll be in the I'll be in the message area to take your questions right now. And if you also would like to ask your questions, um, please use the 
um, the hand raising um, function so I could um, This is the hand raising function so I can easily um, answer your questions for you. Oh yeah, so I got people saying, can we get the slide if it's possible? Yes, we're definitely going to give you the slides. It's going to be available. Okay, amazing. Okay, I got someone who said they couldn't hear me clearly. Yes, you'll be able to get you'll be able to get the slides, right? You'll be able to get the slides. Oh, guys, I'm really sorry. It must be the network, but I'm really really sorry that um, if you were if you were finding it hard to hear me, but uh, I mean, we are going to have the slides available and the recording available as well to everybody who has registered for this session. So thank you so much. You can go on to ask your questions if you have any questions or you'd like to say your questions. Please use the hand raising feature so I can. Um, I can unmute you and you can ask your questions. Thank you so much for your feedback. Thank you everybody who has said that this was a great session and they were able. Okay, amazing. So I'm going to leave the links for you now. I'm going to leave the links here. One second, everybody. Okay, I'm going to unshare my screen for a moment and I'm going to leave the links here. I'm just going to drop the links. So please, if you have any questions, I'll be, I'll be here to answer your questions for a few minutes before we go. So we have about 10 to 15 minutes before we round off the session. So I'll be happy to answer your questions if you have any questions. So I'm going to leave a link to all of the files I have mentioned that I'm going to share with you now. So here you go. Here's the first link. And this link is going to give you access to our content marketing ebook for free. So I'm going to just leave it here. Content marketing ebook. Because I have left the link to the content marketing ebook. You would also get this link um, when we send you um, the recording and also the slides as well. And then the second link I'm sending with you to you rather is that case study. On brand equity. Amazing. So I'm going to be here to take your questions. So if you have any questions, please let me know. So I'm going to go back to the comments area now. Okay, I see everybody has been taking notes. Everybody said they've been taking notes and asking for slides. Okay, amazing. Okay, does anybody have any questions before we round off the session and we call it a close? Okay, everybody, I've been able to share. I have shared the, I've shared both of the links that I've told you guys about. So we're back on my screen. Okay, I'd like to confirm that you all have access to documents now. Okay, don't worry if you don't get the link, if you are not able to copy the link, I would send them to your email addresses. So everybody who have right, registered for this class, 
I'll send them to your email addresses. You get the links, you get the slide, you also get the recording as well. Okay, so I have a question that says, what do you think works more on Instagram, the feeds or the stories? Okay, so um, this is a bit different from I mean, what we have shared, but um, yeah. So you cannot separate it. You cannot, I mean, you cannot say stories work and I'm just going to share content on my stories. Both of them work. But however, because of like the algorithm that um, Instagram has currently on, on its platform, right? You have to utilize every opportunity to reach people. And story, current, stories currently don't have all of those very complicated algorithms, you know, guiding it. So it's really easy when you put up your story, it just appears on the person's screen and every new story becomes the first story of the, uh, on, on your audience screen. So I'd advise that as much as possible, you know, use both of the platforms. But another thing I'm going to share is what kind of content should you share on your story and what kind of content should you share in your feed? So everything can go on your story, right? But then there are certain content that cannot go on your feed that are maybe not perfectly done, that are just looking any, that are just looking anyhow or, you know, not perfect. So for example, right, um, this is the time where everybody are in their houses, a lot of brands are in their houses, they're not in their fancy offices. So especially if you have some kind of aesthetics to your, um, your Instagram, you may not want to, you know, destroy it by posting all sorts of like, weird pictures and all of these different things. So stories give you a platform to be really, really original with your audience. So as much as possible, um, you want to use stories to become personal with your audience. So stories are where you want to put very relatable content, very casual content, very, very serious brand. It's a place where you want to share relatable content as well. Um, so I'll give you an example, right? Um, for Food Pro, right? If we get the CEO of Food Pro to say he's going to share his workout routine, right? With his followers or with, his, with the audience of Food Pro, they can then say, hey guys, we're going to have a takeover by our CEO who's going to show you his workout routine and the things that you know he does currently while we're on lockdown to inspire you. So all of this content may not make it, all of them may not make it to the feed, but there are most of them that would make it, you know, to the Instagram stories because they're just perfect, right? And they are for short term. And another reason why Instagram stories are also good is because of the sense of urgency that it creates. People always feel like I can always come back to your post, right? And so they skip it with the intention that they're going to come back, but they don't come back because by the time they come back, they forget that they made the promise. You know, there's too many content. They don't even remember your handle or anything unless they have saved it. But because people know that stories don't last forever, right? There's this sense of urgency that it creates and people just feel like, oh my God, if I don't see the story now, it's going to disappear. And I don't know when it's going to disappear, right? And people just feel like, let them just watch. So the responsibility now is up to you to quit engaging stories that you know ensures that people don't swipe and swipe and swipe. People actually, you know, you know, sit down and actually consume every slide in your story. All right. So in the absence of any ex any more questions, okay, I don't know if we have more questions. Yes, yeah, so we can connect with your audience better. Yes, definitely. So in the absence of any questions in the comment area, right? If um, and you also don't have any questions, I'm going to um say thank you so much for you know, um, taking our time to join the masterclass. I believe that we've been able to learn, you know, a few things about brand storytelling and we're able to, you know, apply these things, you know, in our content going forward as well. And, you know, this is also a very, very important time when it comes to like businesses connecting with their audience on a different level because brands and businesses are limited to the, you know, the things they can do as a business for their customers. But then, they have so much time and so many, you know, so many platforms available to connect with audiences. So for businesses that would advise that this is the time for you to experiment, you can almost not do anything wrong right now, you know, by being personal, by, you know, connecting with your audience and building deeper relationships, you know, and an extra tip I would give you is don't, you don't have to be perfect, right? You can come out vulnerable, be vulnerable sometimes to your audience also creates this deeper relationship between you and your, you and your audience as well. So coming out vulnerable is also a very, very important tactics. When I say coming out vulnerable is as a brand, share stories currently during this lockdown about how your team is currently you know, facing you know, the crisis, how you're currently surviving the crisis and all of these different things. You create room for people to be empathetic you know, with your brand and to feel like, oh my God, my brand actually is experiencing this thing and we're in this together. Right, and then create a lot of solidarity message as well. So this is a time where brands don't want to be. I know that there's a lot of things we're scared about right now, and we're like, oh my God, we need to sell. Money is not coming in, but you also don't want to make the mistake 
of being desperate, too desperate to sell because everybody's facing this right now. You're not the only person, right? So what you want to do is to, is to be very, very strategic as to the kind of messages you know, that, you, that you're currently sharing with your audience. So um, if that answers your question, I'd like to say thank you so much for being a part of the class today. I hope that you've been able to learn a lot and I thank you so much for all of the feedbacks. The slides will be available for everybody who has attended this session. So we'll send it to you via email. We'll also send you the recording, link to the recording, and also links to the resources that we have you know, mentioned before now. So thank you so much, and I'll see you in our next masterclass.